Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Nuclear Deterrence Forum today. Uh, Russia, I think, as all of you are very well aware, has threatened the use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Uh, China is dramatically building up its nuclear arsenal. Iran may be months from fielding a nuclear capability. And North Korea is testing increasingly advanced intercontinental ballistic missiles. To put it bluntly, the nuclear calculus today is more complex than it's ever been before. Given the upcoming nuclear posture review, it's now more important than ever to think about the future of nuclear deterrence and to get real about the threats that we actually face today. So with that in mind, I'm really pleased to introduce our guest today, Dr. Peter Pry. He's the Executive Director of the Task Force on Homeland Security, as well as the Director of the United States Nuclear Strategy Forum. So Dr. Pry also has authored numerous books on nuclear deterrence, as well as electromagnetic pulse attacks, and holds a certification in nuclear weapons design. And Dr. Pry, uh, welcome and thanks very much for uh, joining us today. Um, what I'd like to do um, is give you a few minutes to discuss some of the top issues uh, that you find of importance, and then we'll dig down into some more detailed questions. So with that, um, over to you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is the fact that I think that the administration and the intelligence community are either lying to the American people or have misconstrued the strategic situation where we stand with Russia by assuring everybody that they see no evidence that Russia has gone to an increased level of readiness. There is an actual technical increased threat, nuclear threat from Russia, uh, and that therefore Putin's nuclear threats are basically bluster and bluffing. And this has been used to justify keeping US strategic nuclear forces at their lowest readiness level, DEFCON 5, you know, which potentially makes them much more vulnerable to a surprise nuclear attack. And all of this seems to be verifying a report that I wrote a couple of years ago called Surprise Attack, ICBMs and the Real Nuclear Threat. Uh, you know, because this idea uh, that we would see the Russians getting ready to attack us is basically a myth. And I think the intelligence community is smart enough to know that. I hope they are. Uh, when I served in the CIA, we knew that the Russian strategic posture is very different from ours. Most Americans think of the Russian triad and the US triad as basically the same, and they are not. Uh, they are designed for completely different purposes. Our strategic triad of bombers and missiles and submarines is designed to deter a nuclear war. Their nuclear triad of ballistic missile submarines and ICBMs and bombers is designed to fight and win a nuclear war, and particularly to achieve surprise attack. Surprise attack to be able to beat us to the draw and strike us. That's why, for example, most of their warheads are on our ICBMs. Most Russian warheads are what's called MIRV. They carry multiple war warheads, and most of their forces on ICBMs. The smallest number of warheads in the US triad is on our ICBMs. We only have 400 Minuteman III with 400 warheads on them. You know, and that's the smallest number of warheads on any leg of the triad. Uh, most of their stuff, is, as I said, is on the MIRV ICBMs, including a heavy ICBMs like the SS-18 Mod 5 that carries 10 warheads on just one ICBM. Whereas our Minuteman 3 has only one warhead on each of them. Well, why is that? Because you can attack and destroy 10 targets with one of those SS-18s. And this is the case for all their mobile missiles as well. The uh, ICBM command and control arrangements are such that we cannot see those forces mobilizing because they are on what a condition that the Russians call constant combat readiness. All the time, they're ready to launch within a few minutes, 24-7, 365 days a year, Vladimir Putin could push a button and launch most of his nuclear weapons at us in just a few minutes without any advanced preparation because they're always ready to launch a surprise nuclear attack. And they don't need that many warheads to achieve a surprise nuclear attack against the United States. The SS-18 alone carries more than 500 warheads. And that's the number you need for counterforce attack against the United States. 
you know, we have fewer than 500 strategic warheads in the United States for a counterforce attack. You know, the 400 ICBM silos, the 40 launch control facilities, three bomber bases, and two ballistic missile submarine bases. Indeed, a surprise attack could deliver a crippling blow to the United States just with five warheads, you know, because you could destroy the three bomber bases and the two ballistic missile submarine ports where most of our submarines are located on a day-to-day -day basis. Another thing most Americans don't understand is that all the submarines are not at sea. Only in about a third of our submarines, we have 12 ballistic missile submarines. Four of those are at sea on a day-to-day -day basis, two in the Atlantic, two in the Pacific. All the rest of them, the other eight submarines, plus the uh, two uh, guided cruise missile submarines, which are on long-term overhaul in both of those ports, all of them would be destroyed with just two warheads targeted on those ports, just with five weapons. Even North Korea can do that. So this idea that they're looking for uh, force-wide mobilization of the Russians, uh, you know, for example, is, uh, is a myth. We have designed our triad for transparency. It's driven by arms control criteria, criteria like transparency and deterrence. Uh, so uh, we know that the adversary would see our, us mobilizing our ballistic missile submarines to send them to sea. We know that they would see us mobilizing our our, our strategic bombers. It takes three days to mobilize the strategic bomber force. And we've done that on purpose. And most of our weapons are on bombers and on, uh, on a ballistic missile submarines because we are concerned about what's called crisis stability. We want to be able to send a signal to our adversaries by starting to mobilize our forces to say, back off. Don't think about getting a, nu a nuclear war with us. Uh, you know, because our whole objective is to avoid a nuclear war in the first place by deterring it. Unfortunately, this kind of a posture does make us vulnerable to surprise attack from the Russians. You know, uh, I have re was just today I was reading some absurd things in the press about, well, you know, we can do whatever we want in Ukraine and we don't have to worry about the nuclear threat from Russia because surely Russia's, Russian generals and uh, people in the launch control facilities would disobey Putin and wouldn't launch his nuclear forces. You know, this assumes that the Russians have been educated, as most of us in the West have been, to think that a nuclear war would be the end of the world, you can't win a nuclear war, uh, and therefore the psychological stress of, uh, of, of launching a nuclear attack would be so great that Putin couldn't count on his officers to execute those nuclear forces. This is really absurd and very dangerous for us to, to bank our survival on the possibility that Russian officers wouldn't push the button and attack us when ordered to do so. They most certainly would. They exercise it all the time. The military doctrine uh, uh, describes making nuclear first strikes to win a nuclear war. They're also postured to win a nuclear war because they have vast, they have the world's strongest anti-missile and anti-bomber defenses, 10,000 anti-ballistic missiles and surface-to-air missiles for anti-missile and anti-bomber purposes, 10,000 of them dual capable so they can carry nuclear or conventional warheads. And unlike us, they have hundreds of deep underground shelters and thousands of uh, less hardened shelters to accommodate their political military elites and their civil and military population. Indeed, the deep underground shelters available to Putin and his general staff are so robust and impervious to nuclear attack uh, that, we, uh, that we wouldn't be able to destroy them. Or at least when we give up the B-83 bomb, which Biden has decided to cancel, the, the last frail hope we would have for deriving a shockwave powerful enough to collapse those underground shelters will be taken away from our deterrent, uh, deterrent forces. So this business that we don't have to worry about uh, 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 that the Russians are not in a more dangerous posture today because of the Ukrainian war and despite their threats is really wishful thinking or it's being said to the American people for political reasons, because the administration doesn't want to have to justify bringing us to the verge of a nuclear war with Russia over, you, over its Ukraine policy. Now, I'll, one last comment I'll make, and then I have to get off my orange crate, I think. Uh, you know, uh, But let's take that myth, another thing where people don't understand fundamentally you know, the difference, the profound difference between uh, uh, Russian strategic forces and our strategic triad those ballistic missile submarines that the Russians have, don't they have to send them to sea in order to attack the United States the way we have to send our boats to sea? 
No, they don't. They have ICBMs on their ballistic missile submarines, so they can reach the United States from port. And they have command and control arrangements on their ballistic missile submarines, so they can launch right from dockside to do that attack. And the ballistic missile subs at sea don't even have to get radio messages that we might be able to intercept. Uh, they usually send their ballistic missile submarines on patrol in the Sea of Okhotsk and the White Sea, which are bastion areas. And on the bottom of those seas, they've, launched, they've, they've laid com command and control cables. So the subs can hook into those cables, and we would never know that they're getting emergency action messages to execute their forces from their submarines. So that's two thirds of their triad that can execute a surprise attack. The bombers are the only ones really that, uh, that we would see mobilizing like us, it, it takes them a couple of days to mobilize their forces. But if they were smart, they might deliberately leave those bombers unmobilized so that we would draw exactly the wrong conclusion about what their ICBMs and the ballistic missile submarines are doing. And last, I would say uh, uh, you know, another thing that is an extraordinary difference between us and them, this idea that uh, the, the officers might disobey orders and not launch, which is on, on its face absurd. Absurd, but you know the Russians have even taken care of that. They have an auto, it's called the automated launch system. Uh, they can put their ICBMs and their ballistic missile submarines on a setting that bypasses the launch control officers, so that Putin or the Russian general staff, commander in chief, or the defense minister can execute those forces all by himself by pushing the button, and that solves the problem of disobedience from lower operational commands. Uh, and I guess last, the Russians also have doomsday machines. Uh, there's a device called perimeter, you know, uh, colloquially known as dead hand, uh, that you could put on a special setting. And basically, if this thing detects radioactive attack, uh, attacks or other criteria, we're not really sure what the criteria is. But if dead hand decides that uh, the political military leadership has been decapitated or that Russia is under attack. A computer takes over and can automatically launch Russia's nuclear forces. And if dead hand uh, or perimeter is wired into another system called Varian, the surprise nuclear missile attack, they have another computer that advises them on when to launch a preemptive first strike. And it could be that these two things could be wired together, uh, you know, to execute a nuclear first strike by computer when they have uh, intelligence parameters that indicate to them uh, that a nuclear war is likely. And, and we don't have anything like that because our system is designed to deter a nuclear war, not to win a nuclear war. And Americans are being misinformed when they're told that, well, it's all bluster and saber rattle, rattling coming out of Russia. We don't have to worry about a nuclear war. I think that the situation right now is more dangerous than the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, uh, another thing we're doing that's unprecedented, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that we've got our forces at the lowest readiness level, DEFCON 5. You know, this is unprecedented that we have good grounds for thinking that the Russians are postured uh, more than they have been in the past to launch a surprise nuclear attack against us. And yet we haven't responded by mobilizing our forces we need to mobilize our forces to a more survivable posture, you know, so that the so that the bombers, for example, could fly off on an emergency basis, so that our ICBM crews are more ready to turn keys if they have to, and and putting our submarines to sea so that they're more survivable. Leaving them at DEFCON five invites a surprise attack, uh, and this is, I think, unprecedented in American history. In the past, when we've had nuclear crises with Russia. Past presidents have mobilized our forces to higher survivability postures, to higher readiness levels, like John F. Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis went all the way up to DEFCON 2, which is just short of a nuclear war. And it worked. It sent Khrushchev the message, you know, uh, that, and he backed down in Cuba, and we basically won that crisis, uh, you know, because of this show of resolve by our, our, our president. We need to show such strength now. Uh, you're not going to weakness is, is not the way to avoid a nuclear war. We need to show strength and show preparedness and uh, not be naive about what's going on in the Kremlin. Um, so let's let's dive deeper into the, some of the issues that you brought up. And, 
and explore some other uh, nuclear deterrence related uh, topics. Um, you've written about the heightened risk of nuclear war with uh, Russia. Uh, and I guess what I'd like to ask you is, how do you assess this right now, given all the dynamics that you raised earlier? Uh, and could you speak to some of the factors that you consider in making your assessment? Well, when I was in the intelligence community, uh, you know, uh, I, I worked very closely with uh, the NIO for strategic warning. And the, the situation we've got going on in Europe now is a classical situation where we would have been concerned about the possibility of nuclear war. You know, you've got a, a major war going on in Europe that involves not just two, but three of the nuclear superpowers, the United States, Russia, and China, because China is involved in this on Russia's side. That political circumstance alone, you know, is extremely alarming. But on top of that, you have Putin ordering the special combat alert, uh, you know, for his strategic nuclear forces. And we've seen the Russians conduct so-called strategic forces exercise all during this period. And in their military doctrine, strategic forces exercises are used to mobilize forces precisely so you can achieve surprise. So it's got all the earmarks of a, of a, of a, nu a major nuclear crisis that we're facing uh, via, via the Russians. Um, uh, obviously, I think uh, uh, many people are are interested in the Russia's threat of e e escalation in Ukraine. Uh, President Zelensky uh, called upon both the U.S. and NATO to be ready uh, for a limited Russian small-scale nuclear strike on Ukraine. What's your read on Russia's willingness uh, to employ uh, nuclear weapons in Ukraine? And I, and I know this is a complex question, but what would you recommend uh, should be the U.S. response in the event of that kind of an action? Well, it's perfectly consistent with their military doctrine. You know, the Russians and their military doctrine have a, a policy of, uh, of what they call de-escalation, which ironically means using nuclear weapons. It could be a strategic strike or, or using them tactically. Uh, most analysts think they would start small with tactical nuclear weapons. And that the shock and awe of the use of the, the first use in Hiroshima and Nagasaki of a nuclear weapon would be so frightening to the West that we would basically back off and be willing to surrender, even if they're losing on the ground. And if the worst case scenarios that were being told by the Ukrainians and by the mainstream media and that Russia is losing and losing badly in Ukraine, and that it is even to the point where Putin has to worry about his control over Russia, that he might fall from power because of that crisis. I personally don't believe that that is true. I think the, I, I think the uh, idea that Russia is losing so badly is greatly exaggerated. But the fog of war is so thick in Ukraine, I don't think we're going to know the truth until some time after, afterwards. But let's assume that, that the mainstream view is correct. This is the worst possible circumstances in terms of possibility of nuclear escalation, because Russia's political and military elite will do whatever is necessary to hold on to power. You know, it's not like in Russia that if you fall from power, you have to wait to the next election, something like that. If you fall from power, you're likely going to be executed, along with your your elites and your even your family that supports you. And so these guys who are war criminals, who are evil, evil people, they will roll the nuclear dice, uh, certainly at the tactical level, possibly at the strategic level, you know, in order to in order to win uh, so that they uh, so that they uh, don't lose in Ukraine and don't lose power. Um, are there fundamental underpinnings from a doctrinal perspective that we should understand when it comes to Russia's employment threshold of uh, nuclear weapons? I mean, quite often, uh, and as you were speaking earlier, I, you know, we tend to mirror image our adversaries. Uh, doesn't that lead us to false assumptions, particularly in this case? Yes, exactly. You know, which is one of the reasons why maybe the intelligence community is giving its honest opinion when it says, well, we don't see force wide mobilization. That could be a mistake based on, although it's hard for me to believe that they've forgotten everything that I had learned when I was working in the intelligence community, but maybe they have. And maybe they're mirror imaging and saying, well, we need to see them mobilizing bombers, sending submarines to sea, and picking up all kinds of uh, radio control. Uh, commands and things like that to convince ourselves that they have gone to a higher strategic posture. 
If that is so, then they have forgotten everything we learned during the Cold War and afterwards about Russian military doctrine and their technological and uh, command and control capabilities. Uh, the, uh, uh, a lot of people, I kind of dodged and I, I just forgot to, to answer. You would ask, what should we do if, if uh, Russia delivers on the threat to uh, do a, a tactical nuclear strike? Uh, I've written some articles about this and uh, there's another uh, option that I think that they would do possibly before a tactical nuclear strike in Ukraine, and that is a nuclear EMP attack. Uh, you know, because it is a more politically acceptable form of the use of a nuclear weapon, at least in the Russian view. Uh, they see if we're closer to a nuclear war, and I think we are, then we're even more proximate to an EMP slash cyber war, because I think that they would do that to try to win that way before they rolled the nuclear dice, uh, you know, that would entail a blast effects, and thermal effects to take out targets for the EMP. For example, the EMP commission in which I served did calculations, you know, if they did a high altitude detonation over Brussels, over NATO headquarters in Brussels, the EMP field would extend from Poland to Ireland and it would black out electric grids across all of Europe. It wouldn't initially kill anybody, but it would basically destroy electronic systems and put all the critical infrastructures into blackout so that NATO would be helpless and we wouldn't be able to project power. Uh, and that alone might be uh, this uh, part of this de-escalation strategy, enough of, enough shock and awe for them to be able to prevail. And uh, we wouldn't be able to do much about them. Uh, the Russians have hardened their own critical infrastructures against EMP and, uh, and cyber warfare threats. At least they're better protected than we in the West are. And so that could be a very attractive option for them. And I think it's more likely they would do that than resort to battlefield use of tactical nuclear weapons. In any case, I would advise that if they did battlefield use of tactical nuclear weapons, or if they did an EMP attack on Europe, I would not recommend that the United States engage in a homeland homeland exchange or in a, or in a tit to tat tactical nuclear uh, exchange with Russia or Ukraine, because the United States, the only vital interest the United States has in Ukraine is to avoid the escalation of the Ukraine crisis into a nuclear war. That's what we have to avoid. Uh, I, I think the United States might be missing an opportunity here uh, to end the war on peaceful terms, uh, you know, by raising the DEFCON level of our forces, you know, going up at least the DEFCON 3 to put them at a more survivable posture, and then communicate to Moscow, look, we're mobilizing our forces because you guys have mobilized your forces. We, neither of us wants to get into a nuclear war. Uh, so stand down your forces and we'll stand down ours. And let's have an immediate ceasefire in Ukraine and negotiate a peace based on the peace treaty that Russia offered before it invaded. Uh, I don't want to be easy on the Russians. This is not an attempt to appease the Russians. Uh, it's an attempt to win the new Cold War uh, because I think if we did that, you know, we might be able to achieve Russian neutrality uh, or maybe even bring them over on our side if we could resolve the Ukrainian crisis in a way that made that makes all the parties happy. Because the real war that we should be worried about is the new Cold War with Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, who have formed a, a block, a solid block that is the most formidable combination of military and economic power the free world has ever faced. And I don't think we can win if Russia and China remain allied. You know, if we negotiated peace with Russia, uh, it would be, it would open the door to hitting the reset button once again. And I think Putin would be open to that. First, because he's losing in Ukraine and would like to have an off ramp uh, if, uh, if that is so. Uh, and second, because I think uh, Russia understands that China in the long run is a bigger threat to their national interests. No, that's very good. And in, in that, that kind of uh, uh, answer to a degree, my follow-up question, which was going to be, in, you know, how do you believe uh, we can best act uh, in deterring Russia? And I guess your answer would be to raise the DEFCON levels. Is that correct? Well, it would be that, but also there are certain things that, that, that can be done uh, that have a longer term impact. Uh, the Biden administration should never have canceled the Slickamen group, for instance. 
We shouldn't have canceled the B-83. Right in the middle of a nuclear crisis is not the time to be eliminating some of your most important nuclear deterrent capabilities. To send them the signal, we should be greatly accelerating our modernization programs for all three legs of the, of the nuclear triad. We should be launching a new Manhattan project to rebuild the nuclear defense scientific and, uh, and industrial base, you know, so that we can compete with Russia and China in terms of building the future nuclear deterrent. Uh, all of these things could have an impact now if we were to act accordingly and show them that this aggression is uh, actually uh, going to harm their long-term interests because the United States is not going to be a sleeping giant and is not going to tolerate uh, a, a, a circumstance where these where our adversaries have achieved the superiority in tactical nuclear weapons and strategic nuclear weapons that we will match and eventually exceed them in the modernity and technological sophistication of our nuclear uh, weapons. We're not doing that. And we should be doing that now. The defense budget should reflect it. The administration's nuclear posture re review should reflect it. Ironically, it, it, it wouldn't be costing us anything in, or, or much in the immediate future, but it would have tremendous symbolic impact in terms of this immediate crisis. And I think we'd get the Kremlin thinking about, gee, has this aggression against Ukraine, is it really worth the candle? You know, if it means uh, that we're going to lose all of these hard won advantages we've gotten, you know, spending 30 years, you know, uh, we've gone on a nuclear deterrence holiday for 30 years. And that's why Russia and now China are, are starting to build up forces that eclipse our capabilities. Let's take that away from them, or at least convince them that we plan to take it away from them and not to do just the opposite, you know, which is, uh, you know, as uh, these nuclear threats loom over us, uh, we end up scaling back our nuclear deterrent capabilities. That's not, that's just the opposite from what we should be doing. I see Peter Wolf's question, Dr. Pry, the political will to do what you recommend in this country is not going to happen. And I act, I agree with him. Uh, you know, I agree with him. Uh, this is the most anti-nuclear administration that we've ever had in American history. And the fact that they're taking these, these self-destructive measures at this moment uh, uh, is a uh, uh, reflects that anti-nuclear radicals have basically captured uh, the White House and uh, important committees in Congress uh, on the Democrat side anyway, when it comes to modernization. Uh, yes, there's an enormous difference between what we should be doing, you know, by strategic logic, the kind of logic we followed during the Cold War, which enabled us to win the Cold War peacefully, versus what is politically possible today. Uh, I agree with you. I don't see... Uh, Hope springs eternal, though, that, uh, that, that maybe the administration will listen to sanity if things start getting worse. Uh, uh, one hope, uh, things that might be uh, possible uh, with this administration are hardening our electric grids and other critical infrastructures against EMP and cyber threats. You know, President Biden uh, has not canceled the White House executive order to protect our critical infrastructures against EMP and cyber. And he's the first president who's actually spending hundreds of millions of dollars to try to make that happen. Although what he does with one hand, he more than takes away with the other because of the climate change agenda, which, uh, which undermines the EMP and cyber preparedness part of the agenda. But, but at least you know, Democrats and Republicans alike seem able to compromise and, 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 and cooperate on achieving EMP and cyber protection. And then, hope springs eternal for space-based missile defense. Uh, uh, you know, it's not true that the Strategic Defense Initiative didn't produce a program. It did. There was a program called Brilliant Pebbles that could have been deployed during the Clinton administration. But uh, Clinton didn't want to pull out of the ABM treaty and uh, thought the idea of mutual assured destruction was the cornerstone of strategic stability. But we could deploy a thousand space-based interceptors in five years for twenty billion dollars, and that could have a, a be a revolution in military affairs. It would shift the advantage away from offensive nuclear weapons and give the advantage to the, to the, the defender. That's what Ronald Reagan hoped he could do to end to escape the mutual assured destruction trap, uh, because arms racing with strategic defenses is stabilizing and good, and it makes the world a safer place, not a more dangerous place where he who strikes first wins, which is basically where we are now. You know, I keep hoping that maybe the Democrats who are so anti-nuclear, 
you know, might be convinced that, look, you know, you're never going to get rid of nuclear weapons and achieve a world without nuclear weapons through arms control. You know, the only way to do it, historically, the only way to bypass a weapon you don't like is to build, come up with a better weapon and uh, to make them technologically obsolete. Uh, you know, and so uh, it may be a naive hope and, and won't work, but if they could be seen, if they could be persuaded of that strategic logic, it's possible that uh, the Biden administration, uh, you know, might go to space-based defense. My hopes are not high. I agree with the skeptics. But if we don't do any of these things, what's the alternative? It looks like we're, we're, we're going to be doomed to getting into a nuclear war with a, a combination of Russia and China or, 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 or doomed to going into an isolationist posture where they win without war which is uh, maybe even more likely. Um, I, I see that you've uh, continued to answer some questions. I, and forgive me since I was offline, but I wanted to shift uh, uh, theaters here uh, and, and move over to China. China obviously is aggressively expanding its nuclear arsenal. Could you comment on your perspectives on what's driving this move? Uh, sure. I think China all along uh, eventually wanted to become a nuclear superpower, uh, you know, but they didn't have the technological capability for many years. Uh, one of the things that's come out of the alliance with Russia and China is technology transfers. I mean, the Russia, China's current superpower capabilities are based on theft of U.S. technology and building upon Russian technology. They can sell to them. Uh, this is in all branches of their services, including uh, intercontinental nuclear missiles, and strategic bombers as well. Uh, I think the uh, uh, China made a strategic decision uh, to, uh, when the United States went on this 30 year deterrence holiday, it saw the opportunity to, uh, to bypass us, to surpass us. Uh, you know, they have developed the DF-41 ICBM, which is equivalent to the best ICBM we ever built, Peacekeeper missile. You know, it carries 10 to 12 warheads and it's mobile. You know, we never actually deployed the Peacekeeper even in a mobile mode. We only built 50 of them in the end and put them all in silos. But they've got the DF-41, a mobile version, and it looks like they're getting ready to deploy uh, perhaps as many as 300, 350 of them in ICBM silos out in the desert. At 10 warheads apiece, that would give them 3,000, 3,500 warheads just on the, uh, the DF-41 ICBM alone which is twice as many warheads that the United States has under the New START Treaty. In our all three legs of the triad, you know, we've only got 1,550 weapons under, under New START. So the DF-41 ICBM alone would enable them to surpass us. And I think that not only is, uh, is China learned from Russia that, that you can use nuclear blackmail and nuclear diplomacy to achieve things without war, and they've learned this from their client state, Iran, and North Korea as well. I mean, look at all the attention you give to Iran just from the threat that they might get the bomb, okay? Billions of dollars to them, uh, you know, uh, betraying the interests of Israel and, and the moderate Arab states. So the utility of nuclear weapons for instruments of blackmail and achieving, uh, achieving your goals without war are clear to China. But I think there's another thing that uh, China is thinking about, and this is one of the reasons why I think it might be it might be possible now, even now, despite the Ukraine war, maybe because of the Ukraine war, to split the, the Sino-Russian access. Because I think that many of those weapons are, are gonna be aimed at Russia, not at the United States. I think uh, China thinks that the West is a pushover and that they probably, and that we're so far behind uh, that they probably can win the new Cold War against us, possibly without actually having it become a real war. And that in the new Cold War III that will, would follow their victory over the United States and the West, uh, uh, the, uh, the external threats that make possible the current Sino-Russian alliance are gonna go away. Totalitarian states are totalitarian states because they want total control of everything. And, and, and the Russians, just like Nazi Germany and, and, and Stalin's communist Russia, will eventually, sooner or later, fall out with each other, especially if they find themselves in charge of the new world order, a new world order dominated by themselves. And so I think they're preparing not just to, to be able to 
win the new Cold War through blackmail or actual nuclear use if they have to, but they're looking in the, toward the future where they don't want Russia to have a strategic advantage over them anymore. They want to become the world's dominant nuclear power. Yeah, well, that's fascinating, and, and thanks for that. Um, uh, just to tag on there a bit, and what I was saying before the, the, the link uh, went out, uh, is to reiterate something you already said or implied, and that's that from a strategic perspective, what's really at play here is the capacity of the United States to deter conflict has significantly eroded over the past 30 years, and, and that's part of why Putin took the actions that he has. He sensed weakness on the part of the United States, and so he's taking advantage um, of that weakness. So the Russian action should really be a wake-up call uh, to rebuild the United States military, uh, because only by achieving the degree of strength necessary to defeat both Chinese aggression in Asia and Russian aggression in Europe in near simultaneous time frames, uh, do I think we can deter either of these situations uh, from occurring. And, and that needs to be the baseline of the new defense strategy, which we all know uh, a version was sent over to the Hill uh, just recently uh, but by golly, it, it sure needs to be revised, I hope, with some of these new uh, uh, insights and perspectives. Um, the, the other piece that I think is extraordinarily uh, concerning is that the actions of the administration uh, in deferring to Putin because of fear of his use of nuclear weapons is sending the message to every potential adversary of the United States out there that they should acquire nuclear weapons as rapidly as possible. Uh, this U.S. submission to Russian nuclear threats is encouraging nuclear proliferation. It's not discouraging it. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, back to China. How do you think China expects uh, the, the, the current situation to impact our plans for operations in the Pacific, particularly their they're increasing their focus on their nuclear weapons capabilities. Yeah, I think the, uh, I think that they're, we, we don't think of Russia as winning the Ukraine war, okay? Uh, but I think from the China, China's perspective, from an objective, rational perspective, there's a lot to be said about Russia winning the Ukraine war because of its nuclear weapons. You know, the uh, Biden administration, uh, you know, has ignored those, and I, and I think rightly so, you know, who want us to jump into the Ukraine war and become much more aggressive in supporting Ukraine, despite the fact that Russia may be doing so bad on the ground. Again, I, I'm not convinced that, that all of that is true, uh, but that's the mainstream view right now, that the Russians are losing, losing badly, uh, despite the fact that if it's true that they are losing and losing badly, uh, the thing that has prevented uh, intervention by the West uh, and deterred intervention by the West on a larger scale and a more aggressive scale so that the Ukrainians could win is Russia's nuclear capabilities. The Ukraine war, I think, is proving very decisively that, hey, if you do get in trouble with your conventional forces and you're not doing, doing well, if you're losing a war, the nuclear superiority can rescue you. And uh, I think the Chinese have noted that. Uh, you know, I don't think that they uh, think they, they would do as badly as, uh, as Russia would uh, against Taiwan, for example. Uh, while all this has go been going on, by the way, uh, China has consolidated its hold on the South China Sea. Uh, that hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but it has happened. And uh, that's one of the most important arteries in the world. Uh, it also will make it harder and harder for us to project power against China, you know, when they build uh, in effect, they've, put, they've pretty much put themselves in a, in a position where they can project Chinese power all over the Pacific right now. It's very analogous to the situation that happened in 1941, you know, not uh, when the Japanese attacked not only Pearl Harbor, but they projected their force all throughout the South Pacific. And they were in a position to project power, you know, and possibly win the Pacific War at that, uh, at that time. And uh, yeah, I mean, the only thing that saved us was the miracle of Midway, you know? Uh, and, and China has achieved without war an analogous strategic position right now, and it's done it in part because of its nuclear deterrent. Uh, those aircraft carrier groups that we rely upon as our chief means uh, of, uh, of, uh, of projecting power are, are increasingly at risk from anti-aircraft 
nuclear armed DF-21 uh, missiles, so-called uh, you know uh, anti-aircraft uh, ballistic missiles, the new technology that we've never encountered before. So uh, th none of this is uh, is good news. And I agree completely with your earlier remarks about how our defense budget and our strategic posture going forward has got to acknowledge these realities. I hope and pray it does. Uh, you know, but uh, as Mr. Wolf, I think that was his last name, pointed out in one of his comments, uh, you know, politically, it, it just doesn't seem, you know, uh, like it's going to happen. Maybe the administration will, uh, at some point, uh, as, as the international security environment deteriorates more and more toward war, possibly toward nuclear war, maybe even this administration will wake up. Uh, it certainly should listen to its own Pentagon. I mean, uh, you know, which is disagreeing with them on things like canceling the, the At some point, things might get so bad that they will uh, that they will follow in the footsteps of John F. Kennedy. I know how naive that must sound at this juncture to everybody that knows what's going on, but uh, uh, you know that that's that that is a that is a hope, uh, you know. Like I said, possibly the strategic defense initiative. Uh, you know, maybe we could exploit this anti-nuclear sentiment that exists in the administration uh, to promote what Ronald Reagan considered to be uh, the, uh, a realistic pathway to uh, achieving a world without nuclear weapons. And it is potentially a realistic pathway. We're getting, we're getting there. I just don't know how bad things are going to get. Will we, are, 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 are we already past the critical point where we can turn these things around? You know, um, we've been talking mostly about the strategic posture, our delivery system. We haven't even talked about the we the weapons. Uh, will those weapons even work? You know, uh, they're the same weapons that were built during the Reagan administration and before, and we've been patching them up. Uh, it's not, I, I, I just wrote an article on this uh, because it's not widely recognized uh, among a lot of people that people who designed those nuclear weapons People who have worked in the so-called science-based stockpile stewardship program have been warning that you know we can have decreasing confidence, decreasing confidence that those old weapons that have been jerry-rigged and patched up over the years that those things will actually work. Uh, there was a, a a law called the Spratt First Amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act that for many years made it illegal for our nuclear weapons labs to even think about nuclear weapons we design. Not hey, only. Peter, let me jump in here I, and because you're getting to something that I want to lead into the next question. It's a good lead into the next question. And also, I, I want to give some time for our, our audience. Um, but given the recent, and, and you mentioned this, you, you mentioned SDI, uh, given all the things that we've been talking about in terms of increased nuclear threat, should we be thinking about homeland defense capabilities uh, differently than we have over the last 30 years? I mean, the, the whole premise of our nuclear deterrent equation has been based on rational actors. Uh, you know, there's been discussion, and I, I don't necessarily fall into this camp, but there's been discussion that, uh, you know, Putin may not, he may be losing his ability to act rationally anymore. So what do you do to, the, the, you can't deter an irrational actor, and perhaps defense is the only uh, alternative. What are your thoughts in that regard? Oh, I definitely agree. I think all future nuclear posture views should take into account the security of our critical infrastructure, which are necessary to support our war fighters and our ability to project power, and particularly the electric grid. You know, this is uh, absolutely indispensable for our security. You know, we need to harden those critical infrastructures. It's EMP and cyber warfare. You know, we should, uh, you know, be developing serious national missile defense. You know, what, what, a, what we have 64 ground-based interceptors is what we've got. I mean, that's a joke, you know, against the Russian and Chinese threats. And in fact, it was never even designed against the Russian and Chinese threats. This right. The North Korea and Iran and North Korea even can challenge the uh, 64 GBIs. We've got to get serious about that. You know, we need to, uh, I think the space-based defenses are, are the way of technologically leap, leaping forward to a place where we may be able to better defend the homeland. Uh, we've got a U.S. Space Force. It ought to be about that, building a missile shield for the United States, not just about protecting our satellites 
from anti-satellite activities, which it seems to be what its chief uh, function is now. If Ronald Reagan was still around, I mean, I know he would be using the U.S. Space Force for the Strategic Defense Initiative. And that's what we should uh, uh, should definitely be doing. Uh, as to the rational actor thing, you know, I I don't think Putin is uh, is irrational and all the rest. Uh, our adversaries in Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, they're differently rational than we are because they come from different, profoundly different strategic cultures. And you know, when we look at Russia, quote unquote, losing in Ukraine, you know. If you were to look at how Russia prosecuted the war against the Mongols or against Napoleon, or how it did in World War II against Hitler, where they lost 30 million dead, but in the end they considered a glorious victory, Russian way of war is very different from ours. You know, uh, uh, in most of these wars, if you took a look at it over a, a, at any time, you'd say, "Oh, the Russians are losing, and losing badly," but they always ended up winning somehow. You know, uh, even though no matter how many dead bodies it cost them. Uh, uh, that's not how we do war. We like to do it much more surgically, fast, limit collateral damage and the rest. Uh, they fight war like a totalitarian power. And, uh, you know, we need to remember that. Uh, uh, so I'm not convinced that the way Russia is handling things now indicates that there's some kind of irrationalism on the part of, uh, right. on, on the part of Putin. I think we're a lot more irrational than they are, you know, by canceling the B-83 and the Silicon Man and other things that we did, uh, this is yeah. Yeah. Okay. Listen, Peter, thanks very much for that discussion. What we're going to do now is uh, open the session to Q&A from the audience. And uh, uh, so let's jump right in. I see that uh, Peter Wolf has got his hand up. Peter, go ahead with your question. General, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for always hosting these sessions. I think they are beyond important. And if we don't survive, at least history books will say, that we were warned. Uh, so that they serve that purpose. Uh, Dr. Pry, everything you say, uh, I agree with. I've studied nuclear affairs for instance, I was a teenager living in Southern California near places like the Rand Corporation and so on. Uh, I have to say that 30 plus years of neglect on our part, we've now reached the stage where I believe, to use a Soviet term, correlation of forces uh, is uh, at our uh, disadvantage and they know that. And the top amount of time that it would take for us to close that gap in the correlation of forces is so great. Are they likely to stand around and wait for us to do that? No, they're not. Uh, you know, they're likely to take advantage of it. And, uh, and that's what I think Putin was planning. That's why he's in Ukraine now, uh, to take advantage of it. And uh, his, uh, his goal, you know, in Ukraine might not be to take over Ukrainian territory. That might not be his chief goal. Uh, there's a, a, a number of alternative realities about what could be happening in Ukraine. You know, maybe Putin wants to have a long protracted war in Ukraine that goes on and on forever, the way that the eight years, you know, we looked at how Russia took over Crimea, you know, very quickly, surgical kind of an operation. And we thought that's what was gonna happen in Ukraine. But maybe we should have paid more attention to what happened in. Donetsk and Luhansk, that eight years of a, of a, of a grinding war that went on there. Russia uh, benefits when there's chaos in the world. You know, uh, uh, the price of oil goes up, uh, arms sales increase, which is another source of revenue. And uh, the West is so averse to war and conflict that we're willing to do almost anything to bring these wars to an end and make all kinds of concessions. Another possibility is uh, maybe he wants us to intervene. It's, when I look at what uh, the Russians are doing, uh, you know, it's almost like they are taking steps that are calculated to be provocative to the West and to get us to intervene in that war. I keep thinking of the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805, you know, Napoleon's greatest victory, uh, where he managed to get the combined armies of Austria and Russia uh, to attack him, uh, you know, by feigning weakness. He had whole regiments run away from the Russians to lure them into attacking him on the Austerlitz battlefield, and then he dropped the hammer. Does, does Russia want Ukraine uh, uh, to become the bloodlands of a World War III, to have NATO and the United States uh, come in there and then use his 10 to 1 advantage in tactical nuclear weapons as a final solution to the problem of NATO and the United States? I mean, 
we might already be there in terms of Russia taking taking advantage of the correlation of forces that uh, that favors it in terms of nuclear nuclear firepower. General, this is Peter Wolf. I have another question, if I may. Sure, go ahead. And this is a very controversial question, Doctor. Uh, 20 years ago, I said there are three countries in the world whose days are numbered in this order, Ukraine, Taiwan, and Israel. I think I'm on track for Ukraine right now. Why Israel? I think I'm on track for Taiwan eventually. So why Israel? I'm one of the only people I think I know who does not believe that Israel has nuclear weapons. I think it has been a fantastically successful dodge and bluff uh, over the years because nothing in their behavior indicates a country that has nuclear weapons. Uh, they've never tested them, they've never shown them and displayed. They have all the characteristics of a country that does not have nuclear weapons versus all the characteristics of countries that do have nuclear weapons. If I am correct, uh, and this is revealed to be true, then uh, then this is a country that, in my opinion, is very, very vulnerable because there'll be a lot of countries in the world, including Russia, say we were duped for a long time in believing this, and, we're, and now we're mad. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm glad the United States is not on your list of countries that are uh, not long for this world, <laughs> you know? Actually, uh, it is. Okay, <laughs> all right, well, I, 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 I'm, Looking at it from a strategic objective point of view, I would have to agree with you from the point of view of a person who spent my professional lifetime as a strategic analyst. Uh, but I always remember this, you know, the uh, admonition of the uh, great German statesman Otto von Bismarck, you know, that God looks after uh, uh, fools, drunkards, little children in the United States of America. And if you yes. want to look at our history, that actually seems to be empirically provable uh, maybe maybe it'll tr turn out to be true for us again. I don't know where the rescue is going to come from. Uh, maybe it'll come from conversations like this, uh, and and we can and we can somehow unexpectedly turn things around. Uh, as to the, I think Israel does have nuclear weapons. My my first uh, one of my first books was on Israel's nuclear arsenal, so I'm very familiar with the data on that. Uh, uh, if if they if they have done a job trying to deceive us into the idea that they're a nuclear weapons state. They've done an excellent job. I mean, we actually yes. do have photographs of, uh, you know, uh, that were provided by Israeli Mordecai Benunu, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, of the thermonuclear device, you know, the guts, the internal workings of a, of a thermonuclear device that Israel built. And I was, I was, uh, they're both, they're both passed away now, but my old, mentor Bill Van Cleve and uh, oh another uh, my senility is getting me the inventor of the US neutron bomb uh, you recall his name uh, uh, Sam Cohen okay we had a conversation on the uh, 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 at USC as a matter of fact and they uh, they were talking we were talking about my book and uh, Cohen and Van Cleve both told me that they had they had been to Israel and they had seen Israel's nuclear weapons. But again, maybe that was all a great disinformation campaign. I think they've got them. But uh, I don't know how, uh, if Iran gets the bomb, you know, I don't know that that's going to deter Iran. You know, uh, uh, you know I think uh, uh, the, uh, the relative ethical level of Israel is so much greater than that of Iran. It's going to be one of those cases of he who strikes first wins. And my money would be on the Iranians. Okay, that's an, uh, an interesting discussion. Let's go to uh, text questions for a second. Um, this one is from Arun Chatur. Uh, forgive me if I didn't get that right. But his question is uh, one related to the rational actor assumption. And he says, I think it's quite right to suggest that Putin, Xi, Kim, etc., are from fundamentally different cultures. So given that, and that a traditional focus on rebuilding our nuclear forces may be politically untenable, what other options, if any, does this administration have to deter and or incentivize Russia differently? What could a Biden administration do now that it should also actually be willing to do your thoughts peter 
Well, uh, again, I think we are making a mistake by trying to back Russia into a corner and make them an enemy. I think part of the solution might be diplomatic. The, uh, I, I think our highest foreign policy goal should be to split the Sino-Russian alliance. Uh, I had outlined earlier uh, a way where we might be able to do that by raising the DEFCON level, going into negotiations on the basis of the Russian peace treaty, uh, and uh, uh, to give Russia an off-ramp to achieve peace in Ukraine, but also it would be an opportunity for us to reset, hit the reset button. There's a lot that we could give Russia that I think is actually as much in our interests and it is in Russia's interest. And it would give Putin, uh, you know, a win. For example, you know, I, I, I think the idea that NATO shouldn't expand any further eastward is perfectly rational. I never wanted, personally, I was against expanding NATO eastward in the first place. It was guaranteed to create the situation we're in today. Uh, you know, uh, the American people don't want to go to nuclear war for the uh, sovereignty of Kazakhstan and Tajikistan and countries they can't even find, find on the map. Uh, that concession alone, you know, might uh, might be enough to basically hit the reset button with Russia. But NATO is not going to expand further eastward. We don't have to worry about encirclement. Uh, but there are other things that are uh, uh, that that could be conceded to them uh, that would actually be better for us. Like all those tactical nuclear weapons. I mean, we have 180 obsolete gravity bombs that are tactical nuclear weapons in Europe. They're really not usable. I mean, we have to get the permission of the governments. I can't in picture Germany or Italy or the United Kingdom uh, that if we needed to do tactical nuclear strikes to save, well, let's say Ukraine or Lithuania, that they would agree uh, to make themselves a target for Russia. You know, uh, so those weapons are not even usable to us. That's why the Slick Amen was so important. It didn't have to be based in a foreign country. We had would have perfect control and we could build enough of them to start offsetting the tremendous numerical advantage that the, uh, that, that the Russians had. So my first answer to that would be diplomacy to try to, to, try to split the Sino-Russian alliance. If we could do that and isolate China, I think the competition uh, with, between East and West would go back to the diplomatic and economic level and pull us back from the threshold of war, which is where, where we are now all over the world, China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. Uh, and we are at the threshold of war because we've allowed our nuclear and military posture to so deteriorate you know, with these countries. Obviously, we need a crash program. But as I said, uh, you know, the Biden administration, it's highly unlikely they're going to be convinced to uh, modernize our nuclear weapons. But, but cyber and EMP protection, that's something we can do. Space-based missile defense might be possible. That could change the whole name of the game. You know, so th those are the three prongs I would uh, recommend. You know, diplomacy, homeland security, both active by space-based defense as well as passive through cyber and EMP hardening of our critical infrastructures, and uh, uh, and, uh, and and the SDI issue to render adversary nuclear weapons obsolete if we can if we can do that and i think we can all right well ladies and gentlemen unfortunately we've come to end of this uh, installment of mitchell institute's nuclear deterrence forum uh dr pry thanks again for joining us today um, for our audience our next event will be a space power forum on may 10th with congressman jim cooper so you don't want to miss that one and finally, from all of us at the Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day. Thank you so much for having me.